Good evening and welcome to The Early Set. The Early Set is a weekly talk show dedicated to the artists who make live jazz and more happen in New York City and beyond. Uh, I'm your host, vocalist and songwriter, Gabrielle Stravelli. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. You can find out more about me at my website, which is gabriellestravelli.com. Uh, if you're watching this on Facebook, I do have a Facebook uh, music page, which is Gabrielle Stravelli Music. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, I also have a channel there. You're already there. It's also Gabrielle Stravelli Music you go ahead and click that little subscribe button while you're at it. Um, and I'm also going to let you guys know that you can hear me tomorrow night. I'm going to be performing uh, with a live trio. We will be socially distanced, so don't anybody worry. Um, but I have a gig tomorrow night um, at a theater in New Jersey, and I'm going to be doing my Willie Nelson set. Last year, I released an album uh, sort of looking at the music of Willie Nelson through a jazz lens. And I really love this project. And I'm super psyched to be singing the music again and to be singing with live musicians. So that is tomorrow night, uh, Thursday the 16th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And we're going to be on the Facebook page of the theater, which is it's the Axelrod Performing Arts Center. And their Facebook page is facebook.com slash Axelrod arts. So join me. Come pull up a chair. Join me tomorrow at 7 p.m. My guest this evening, I am so thrilled to have on the early set this evening, Leah Delaria. Um, before I welcome her, I'm going to give a shout out to a couple things that I've been enjoying lately and that I think you will like as well. So the first thing I want to give a shout out to is a fantastic online show. Some of you, if you've been watching the early set, you will know this show uh, because we opened our very first guests were the vocalists Janice Siegel and Lauren Kinnan, and they have an online show called Vocal Gumbo. Vocal Gumbo is the online version of a show they were doing in the before time, uh, before all the clubs shut down. They had this monthly series called Vocal Mania. And Vocal Gumbo is the same thing, it's just all online for obvious reasons. And they invite uh, members from the vocal jazz community and it really runs the gamut in terms of you have really well-known people who've been you know, doing this for a really long time, all the way to people who, singers who just graduated from jazz programs. So you really, you can get to know new people. And um, they, Janice and Lauren do solo numbers, different people do solo numbers, but they have a lot of really amazing collaborations. And I'm actually, we're gonna roll, just so you guys can get a sense of what they do on Vocal Gumbo. Um, we're gonna roll a clip of a collaboration that Janice did with a, a Brazilian vocalist and musician. Let's see that now. You bup, bup, tip, tip. they call the primatali gumbo it's not always that kooky i know that had sort of a um a wonderful peewee's playhouse vibe um again the show is super creative and playful and and you're gonna get videos of people just singing a, a standard with a piano to that kind of stuff and Brazilian vocal groups and just everything. It's wonderful. Their next episode is this weekend. It's going to air on Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern, and you can watch them on Facebook. They are at facebook.com slash vocal gumbo. And I just suggest that you join them because it's beautiful. And they're also, I will say for Janice and Lauren, they are so good at also engaging um, guests in conversation about issues 
the country is dealing with right now, you know? Um, so it's, it's still, it's very relevant and they really speak to what's going on right now through music. So check that out, Vocal Gumbo, this coming Saturday at 5 p.m. The second thing I want to shout out before I bring Leah on is uh, an old album. This is not new. This is an album released in 1962, and it's Oscar Peterson's West Side Story. Um, let's hear, I'm going to talk about it just for a minute. Let's hear on um, the Oscar Peterson's, uh, the, the trio's arrangement of Something's Coming from West Side Story. <laughs> Oh my God, that makes me so happy every single time I hear it. Um, I love this album. I think this should be in everyone's record collection. Whether or not you consider yourself a jazz head doesn't matter. This is a beautiful album. I think you heard, you know, that trio. So it was Oscar Peterson, the pianist, Ray Brown on bass, one of one of the greats, and Ed Thigpen on drums. Um, I love this album not only because these guys are such masters. The fun thing about it is that so you know West Side Story that score was was well known when they recorded this, um, and so instead of planning things out ahead of time and and creating arrangements, the trio went into the studio and just played and laid down their impressions of seven songs from the West Side Story score. And I think that that spontaneity really, really comes through in the recording. Um, it's, it's one of my favorites. I also do think that if you don't, if you're not accustomed to listening to instrumental jazz in particular, this could be a great place for you to dip your toes into that pool because you will probably be familiar with some of the melodies and um, that'll help yeah, context is everything. It'll help you get um, a little bit better idea of what jazz musicians do, um, where they change the melody, where they honor it, where they change the rhythms, where they leave them as they are. So I highly recommend checking out Oscar Peterson's West Side Story. We are gratefully accepting your donations this evening through Venmo and PayPal. I'm Gabrielle Stravelli on Venmo and PayPal.me slash Gabrielle Stravilli. Um, we use these donations to pay for the platform that we're streaming on, but also we donate a portion of these proceeds to uh, a guest uh, a choice of charity. And tonight Leah has chosen the Ali Forney Center to donate money to. And I'm so delighted to share some of these funds with the Ali Forney Center. Um, Ali Forney Center is based in New York City. They are the largest LGBTQ plus community center helping LGBTQ plus homeless youth. You may or not uh, may not know that um, LGBTQ plus youth have a higher rate of homelessness than some populations. And the Ali Forney Center is doing amazing work supporting these kids. So please, uh, we ask that you send in whatever you are able to, we know, Things are weird right now and money's tight, but if you're able to, um, we're so grateful and we will be so happy to share proceeds with the Ali Forney Center. Leah Delaria has had an incredibly varied career. She is a SAG award winning actress. Uh, she has starred in Broadway and off-Broadway musicals. She was the first openly gay comic on American television. And the role I want to talk to her about tonight is her uh, long career as a jazz musician, recording albums and playing in clubs and festivals in the US and throughout the world. 
So without further ado, please help me welcome to the early set, Leah Delaria. Hey y'all. Hi. Oh. What you drinking? Tequila. Wow. Casa, Casa Amigos and Yeho Tequila. Wait, yes. there we go. Oh my God. I can't, I'm on my iPad. I can never tell what the fucking camera is. Sorry. <laughs> that was perfect. So much easier. We so much easier when you're shooting something. There's a red light. You know exactly where to look. Okay. Well, you, you nailed it. You're well practiced and you, you did it. So thank That's you for that. Um, thank you so much. I'm just going to keep saying that all night. I'm so excited to have you and so excited to talk to you about your work as a musician. So this past week, as I was prepping for the show and I'm list I was going like all the way back, listening to your first album, live performances. And it was, you know, it's been clear to me that you know, jazz music, you have a, a deep sense of swing, but your bio <laughs> says nothing about how you got to that point. So I finally stumbled on an interview where you mentioned that your dad was a jazz pianist, but I, I want to hear more about that. I want to hear about your musical upbringing. Sure. I was raised in a, a pretty artistic household. Uh, my dad was a was a musician until the music ran out. He was made his living as a musician. But you know what happened to most of the jazz musicians at the time? The music ran. The music just went away um, because rock came in, okay. and that's what that's what people were listening to. So he couldn't support his family of mm -hmm. five kids and a wife uh, with you know the very minimal amount of money that he was making. So finally, he had to like get a day job and stop performing but mm. he always played he was always very into you know the music that was around my mother was a dancer so she also liked music uh. so um yeah they met each other in the uso he was a piano player in the army <laughs> air corps and she was a dancer in the uso and that's how they met um so in that sweet it's a little too sweet for me i mean like <laughs> when you look at me and you hear that story you're like what the fuck it's very yeah, I already sweet. have diabetes. I just about lost a toe telling that story. It's so sweet. But ah! it's, it's a true fact. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so there was always music in the house. Dad was always playing the piano. Um, he could tell I was very interested in it, mm -hmm. very interested in it from a very young age. So, you know, he would kind of sit me down next to the piano and he'd play some notes and then I, he'd have me sing them. Okay. And then we'd talk about we talk about the how uh, the numbers um correlate to the to the letters and all you know all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. like he was giving me he was giving me like fucking theory class <laughs> i was like nine that's so, awesome you know, it just it was obvious that he missed the music if you know what i mean but okay. uh, i was a very willing pupil i was a really willing student with him in fact he tried to teach me the piano and i just wanted to play kickball <laughs> and to, to this day, I want to kick my own fucking head because I, know. I wish I had learned, you know what I mean? I mm -hmm. wish, because I mean, I'm really musical, so I probably would have been pretty good at it if I just sat down and done it, you know? Yeah. And, and sort of I'm like 62, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to try to learn to play music. <laughs> Did you, know, you have... I have a beautiful, beautiful one in my living room. You do? Amazing. Oh, yeah. I do indeed. Okay. Every, everyone else gets to play it. I don't, but my pianists come over and play all the time. And did you ever work? Like, did you ever gig with your? Did did you get to see him on gigs? Or did oh, when you... I was a kid, he would take me into the clubs with him. Wow! And I would sing. It it, it was like, you know, it was like a circus act. It's mm. you know the you know the cats would get a break, and then I'd come in and sing a duet with my dad. You know, Aww. you know, like the little, here's the here's my little nine year old daughter singing summertime or you know whatever. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Can you think of any, um, can you just be one or a couple of albums that you heard when you were a kid that like really inspired you to pursue it or you know what I mean? Or just made you like, oh man, this, this thing is jazz is its own thing. And I'm, t and I'm into it. Well, my parents had a fight jazz wise. Like my mom really loved Big band swing. Okay. You know, they were at that age. So she loved the big band swing sound. Okay. My dad was a combo guy. You know what uh, I mean? He was, yeah. he was a bebop guy. Okay. 100% bebop. So they would play different records, right? But where they met 
was Ella Fitzgerald. And I, yeah, I grew up listening to Ella constantly okay. in my house. You know, that's what, that's what they were, when they weren't listening to a comedy album, they loved comedy. Oh, wow. That, that, wow. Uh, no. At that time, people would put out comedy records, so they yeah. had that. Um, my mom often was listening to Harry Belafonte, so I would listen. I listened to a lot of Harry Belafonte mm -hmm. when I was growing up, and uh, but mostly I remember Ella. I mean, Ella was just such a, a sound that came out of my came was always coming out of the house when I was when I was growing up, yeah. and I adored her. You know, I loved her as a as a child. Mm -hmm. but, but it was that magnificent sound, that beautiful voice. Yep. I love Terry Belafonte too. I used to sing Harry Belafonte all the time. So they played more than just jazz in the house. You got to hear. Oh yeah. Well, I heard a lot. Yeah. They, they played, uh, I mean, you could call, you could call Harry sort of pop jazz. Cause he had a lot of, mm. he had a lot of Latin influence. Mm. In, in his mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's the stuff they're playing. Also, I think my mom just thought Harry Belafonte was hot. <laughs> I really do. He's crush worthy. But Ella, and you know, also, well, you know, my dad, of course, so he's a pianist. So I also heard a lot of Oscar Peterson. I heard okay. a lot of Art Tatum. Ah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. My, nobody could touch Art when it comes to yeah. that sort of improvisation. The man just yep. is amazing. Hmm. Um, my dad was obsessed with Dick Spiderbeck. So okay. I heard a lot of Dick's, you know, no. more of a swingy guy, but just because of his, you know, he always preferred Bix to, to like Louis Armstrong, for example. Okay. okay. So, you know, just stuff like that. And then I like the more modern guys. But, you, you know, that, there was always, there was just always it was there. It was just always in the air. Hmm. He often had guys come over and play with him. Okay. You know, when we were, when we were kids, we would, um, you know, it would be like they'd come after a gig and it would be really late at night, you know. And then, you know, wake my mom up and my mom would be like, Bob, oh, the kid to sleep, you know, the whole thing. And she would, he would somehow charm her into making breakfast for everybody. <laughs> and, then would, and then they would play. I mean, it would be it's like three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning and they'd be playing in our, this little suburb of, you know, of St. Louis. Wow. And then we'd all sit, you know, hope, you know, at the top of the steps, <laughs> hoping not to get caught. Uh. Listen. Listening to the party going on downstairs, you know. Did any of your other siblings pursue music as a career or? No. Okay. No. Just you. No. I was the only one that I'm, I'm the only one ever been brave enough to do anything like that in my family. Wow. Wow. You know, the rest of them have always been like, we want, we want a steady job. We want a paycheck. We want, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I'm a Martian to them. They can't believe what I've done. Sometimes they just go, I can't believe you've done this. You know? <laughs> No, haven't had a day job since 1982. Man. So speaking of, um, you led me right into the next question, Brave Choices. Oh, good. So your debut album, 2001, I believe. Is that right? <laughs> Just Lesbians eat long? Yeah. Oh my God. Um, sorry, my debut album. <laughs> Don't apologize. On the World Jazz label, play it cool. Um, you're still laughing. Yes. Yeah, there she is. Which reimagines show tunes do in a jazz context. Do you recognize where I am? Do you recognize it, Gabrielle? Where is no? it? That is the original Joe's Pub. That was <gasps> Joe's Pub, what it, what it originally looked like. Wow. It looked, it looked like piano keys. So that's me sitting at the bar at Joe's Pub, at the original Joe's Pub. That is yeah, no I did the whole photo shoot there. Wow. Yeah, I had like forgotten that it didn't one at one point didn't look. I'm only think of it the way it looks now. Oh, that's well, awesome. it's been decorated, I think, twice since then. You know what I mean? It's wow. just really, yeah. Um, I um okay. So you open the album with this very unexpected choice. I'm not gonna say what it is yet is yet. Julie, um, our producer, is going to roll a little bit of that clip. And then we'll talk about it. Okay. Attend the tale of Sweeney Todd. His skin was pale and his eyes were sad. He shaved the faces of gentlemen who never. 
That arrangement so much. I love this. Uh oh, whole... I can't oh. hear you. Oh no, Gabrielle, I can't hear you. I don't know why. Okay, Julie, will you will you fly in and assist us? Technical difficulty. Julie can't hear Gabrielle. Oh, that's crazy. Um, Gabrielle, back either. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you, Julie, but I can't hear Gabrielle. Can you try again? Okay, Gabrielle, yeah. I'm pull you I'm... Up and back in. Okay, hang on one second. Okay, cool. Hello, I'm back. Can you hear me? Hopefully this is going to work. Oh, here you are. I can hear you now. Yes. We're back? Great. Oh, I couldn't hear you either. Nor could I hear the nor could I hear the ballad of Sweeney Todd, which I it's a blessing to me because I have to fucking sing it all the time. <laughs> I know. I I was like, I know she's probably had to tell this story so many times, but it is just such an amazing choice. And I feel like you were ahead of the curve in terms of doing Sondheim in a, you know, as jazz. Like a, that's very, become very common, but it really wasn't when you did that. So it, yeah, it, begs, it begs the question, how on earth did you? <laughs> and of all the songs. Well, let me just say this about that. A lot of the reason that a lot of jazz musicians don't do Sondheim and, and didn't, and now they're loosening up a little bit more, Steve really doesn't like it. Really? <laughs> I'm, I've been given permission to call him Steve, so I'm gonna call him Steve. Okay. But he's really, he doesn't like when you fuck with his stuff, you know <laughs> right. what I mean? Yes. But he loves this version of the Ballad of Sweeney Todd and has written, and like we, when he saw it live, at Carnegie Hall, because it was a tribute to Steve uh -huh. and I'm at Carnegie Hall. When he saw it live, he, he came back and knocked on the my dressing room door to to tell me how much he uh, liked it. Tell me to please call him Steve. Uh, and you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm sure the reason is, we follow the form exactly. Uh -huh. We do not change the form at all. So it's got those tricky little Sondheim things where it's, the only thing we change is that there's a 24 bar blues solo piano solo in the middle of it. Okay. Other than that, it's the exact form of the song. Hmm. So it cuts out at odd at, at odd measures. You know, whenever I play with guys that are reading the chart for the first time, I'm like, you think this is easy. It's not. Uh -huh. Do not take your face out of that chart. Sorry about my alarm. <laughs> Time to take my medication. Oh. Um, <laughs> Do you need to take um, your medication? Do not take your face out of the chart because it's going to surprise you. Right. You cut to places where you're not going to expect. There are phrases that won't end, that won't be an eight-bar phrase. It's sun. Yeah. So there's going to be a six-bar phrase that goes to a seven, and then we'll go into a run of four, you know, like four four bars, four by fours, you know. It's like, it's, it's Looney Tunes. Yeah. But I think that's why he likes it so much. Why did I do it? As a joke, honest to God, I did it as a joke. <laughs> I was at the duplex. I was at the duplex of all places one night with uh, my friend John McMahon, who was playing the piano there, and we were both incredibly high. <laughs> We'd smoked a lot of marijuana, <laughs> and there were all these NYU musical theater students. This is a great story. So you got me, Gabrielle. I'm going to tell you a great story. Yes. There were all these. <laughs> <laughs> NYC musical theater students there and I was in a Broadway show so when I walked I kind of walked in the door a hush came over the room if you mm -hmm. know what I mean even though I was completely drunk and high <laughs> and I was like check with John and, and you could see these musical theater students they like huddled and had a conversation you know they were just <laughs> and then they weren't stupid they sent the prettiest girl in the group over ah. 
she <laughs> talked to me and asked me if I would sing. And John and I are just old friends and Looney Tunes. So I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do you as a number, you know, and I go up and I go up and John and I just basically started making fun of them doing musical theater in the way it should never be done. You know, we did, we did like the hip hop version of Annie and stuff like, which is ridiculous <laughs> stuff. And we even made up, we started to make up a, the musical version of uh, the Diary of Anne Frank called Let's oh, Frank. Geez. We did. I am a Jew and you are a Jew. Let's hide in the attic together. Yeah, I mean, just. Good night, everybody. So, yeah, good night. So John <laughs> turns to me and he goes, I have a great idea. Let's do the ballad of Sweetie Todd, but let's do it, you know, swing. And we laughed and laughed and laughed. And just thought that was just fucking hilarious. <laughs> like very lounge against the machine, right? Right. And then we started to do it and we got like eight bars in and you know, you know, 16 bars or so in. Like mm -hmm. he had this really, he had this really I changed the groove, Larry Grenadier and I changed the groove, and okay. we have that kind of boom, boom, boom. But he was doing the dim 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 dim, which also works. Dim 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 dim. A tender tale of sweetie time. And we got into it, went through the first verse, looked at each other and went, wait a minute, this fucking works. <laughs> it's actually really good. So yeah, I tinkered with it a little bit more. And that song is the reason I got the record deal from Warner Brothers, because I did it at that Carnegie Hall show. Ah. And that's where that's where the A and Matt Pearson, the AR guy at Warner Jazz, the president of Warner Jazz, heard it. Wow. So right after Sondheim left, where I was jumping up and down in my dressing room, mm -hmm. just like screaming, because I just met Steve Sondheim mm -hmm. and he liked what I did with his song, you know, <laughs> for Lord. So I'm like screaming and jumping up and down. And then there's a knock on the door and it's Matt Pearson, the AR rep from Warner Brothers, offering me a four record deal on the wow. spot. Yeah, it was kind of amazing. Wow. Thank so that's you. That's the story. Of the ballad of Sweeney Tide. Thank you for now, coming. The rest again. of them are harder. The rest of them was like <laughs> going through song after song, trying to, but yeah, that first record, we would have like 50 songs and we'd finally get it whittled down to 15 and then suddenly there'd be 20 more. And yeah. Huh. Yeah. So it wasn't that it was like, it wasn't that it was hard to find song. There were too many songs that there were. There were too many. Okay. And that, I, and because I'm a musical theater freak. You know, because I do both things mm -hmm. and love both things. And so, I mean, I was coming to the table and even with, we had a stipulation, we didn't want to do anything old, anything really old. Oh, we okay. wanted to do stuff that was more modern. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. So nothing, nothing later than the seventies. Okay. And even that we kept stuff, the stuff was mostly um, 80s and 90s stuff. Like yeah. that's when the record came out at the beginning of the turn of the century, I think 2001. So, yeah. So we even had those stipulations, but it was like, you know, with every breath I take was just, there was no, that was a no brainer. I love that. Song. That was, that was going to be the ballad. Okay. You know, that, yeah, that was, that's the ballad. And mm -hmm. then of course, welcome my party. Cause Michael John LaCuse had just done his welcome my party. And Michael John Lacusa is the most jazz oriented um, Broadway hmm. composer I think that we have. More so than Sondheim with all due respect to Stephen because I just feel that Steve is more, um, more of a contemporary um, classical person in the way that he does this stuff. But that's why it huh. feels so jazz used and why it works because a lot, a lot of bebop and jazz steal from, especially the Russian modern, modern Stravinsky, people mm -hmm. like that in, in their chord progression. Yep. So, I mean, but but Michael John Lacusa is pure jazz. Hmm. Everything he does, pure jazz. You know, that's why I have him on several of my records. Okay. And you you do um I've got your number on that record as well, don't you? That's probably the oldest track on the on the record. Yeah. Nobody does that song. I sing that song. You never hear it. And I love that song. It's such a, such a great song. Such a great song. And you know, and Gil Goldstein, you know, we, we should say who the musicians were on Sweeney Todd because they're great. they're marquee and love people. Um like Larry Golding's on the piano, mm -hmm. Larry Grenadier on bass, Greg Hutchinson on drums. Okay. Um 
they still love recording with Greg because um, every time he'd open the drum room, <laughs> there's just this cloud of green smoke would come out. Just, <laughs> oh, I guess Ooh. Greg's. Greg's been hitting the weed in the drum room. Oh. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> what a great drummer. That's why you were playing that the West Side Story, that track on my record of Cool, mm -hmm. um, which is from the 50s. I'm the first to admit it. But that was one that I, I fought very hard for it. I said, look, I know everybody does Bernstein like this. You know, I'm a Bernstein girl. I became famous doing right. Bernstein musical. And this is this particular song is the just a great song. So we were lucky to do that. And that was with Brad Meldow. So that's Brad Meldow and, oh, and wow. Larry and Craig. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. And then on I've Got Your Number, it's Gil Goldstein. And uh, Gil is my arrangement guy. He's been my arrangement guy for a long time. And for people who are love jazz and don't know, Gil Goldstein is probably one of the top 50 jazz pianists in the world, if not more than that. Mm -hmm. He is the top jazz accordion player of all things. And he did all the um, horn arrangements for Miles Davis. He's he's no, no slouch. Yeah. He's a well-known guy. And yeah, and he and I just connect when it comes to arrangements in a really lovely way. And so... That's why the, my first couple records were all Gil. And then the the third record, the Live Smoke Sessions, is just Gil on piano. He didn't do many of the arrangements. Okay. I did a lot of those. See, and I wanted, I, to, I wanted to ask you, how involved are you in the arrangement process? Hugely. Yeah. Hugely. I have ideas. Mm -hmm. I have ideas and I'm not afraid. I'm yep. not afraid. And look, I'm smart, too. I know when to shut up and listen to yeah. Gil fucking Goldstein, Jesus Christ, you know. And to Matt Pearson and the people that I've worked with. I mean, I, but I also have ideas, you know what I mean? The, yeah, a lot to bring of the to the table on me, right? And um, yeah, when the David Bowie record, my latest record, um, I, I am listed as a, an arranger on every track. Mm -hmm. yeah, I because I was an arranger. Yeah, and I think that's important too, because a lot of times I think that, um, Female singers are often not credited with that stuff. And it's Chick like, what singers? Chick singers? Yeah. You know, and it they people just assume like, nah, you don't know anything. You didn't, you couldn't have come up with that. And it's like, no, I I actually had the vision for this. So I I imagined you were involved. And I think it's awesome that you are listed as one of the arrangers on that record. On a lot of them. You know, I have a, I mean, it's so simple. I do Miss Otis Regrets. This is on the live smoke sessions, and I do it New New Orleans. Wait, wait. I'm gonna play that clip. Say what? I literally pulled. I, I, I let's go to that now because I was going to ask oh, you about that song because yeah. it blew my mind. Let's, Julie, if we can, let's hear a little bit of that clip. I want you to talk about that. When she woke up and found that her dream of love was gone. Madam, she went up to uh, the man who led her astray, and from under her velvet gown, she drew a gun and shot her lover down. Madam, Miss Otis regret she's unable to lunch today. That song is usually, and I feel like I'm I'm gonna get shit for a second. It's usually such a dirge. And then I heard yeah. I listened to the song and I was like, how the hell did you think of that? How did you hear it like it's, that? Uh, came to me in a dream. <laughs> um, when I was working with, I was doing a show called um, It's Delightful, It's Delicious, It's Delaria. Okay. So I was gonna do all Cole Porter tunes but do them, you know, in ah, crazy ways. Okay. That's basically it. And um, that one, uh, that one I did in conjunction with Marianne McSweeney and Jeanette Mason. Okay. And um, I said exactly what you said. Everybody always does this like a dirge. <laughs> what if we do it? What if we do a combination where it's, it's very, we fuse the New Orleans beat with a kind of funky soul singing sound for uh -huh. me. 
which is the idea. And you can see that that's what we're doing. And everybody was like, well, yeah, let's do that. So the band is doing very New Orleans stuff mm -hmm. in the way that they play. I am not as a singer. I'm doing, I'm doing a very, very soul kind of yeah. sound in my voice and in the and in the notes that I sing. So that was the kind of that's what we came up with for that one, and it just stuck. And I'm telling you, every singer on the planet was like, when I first did it, every singer on the planet was, I really want to record that. It's like, yeah, I'm gonna record it. <laughs> my idea <laughs> so I, I love I'm it. Recording it I'm doing it Hell no my arrangement but that's always been McGarry, that's always been um the mark of what I do mm -hmm. as a you know as a, a jazz person I really don't do standards I mean that record has is the only record I have of standards and even then I reinvent them in such a way that they don't feel like standards anymore, if you know what I mean. Yeah. For example, Miss Otis Regrets. But it works. And <laughs> yes, of course it works. I mean, it works with everything that I do. I mean, jazz is a language. I mean, you know this. It's a language. And you can apply that language to anything. <laughs> then you can apply the language of jazz and the sound of jazz to anything. You know, again, which is why every record I have is a little odd in the jazz world. You know, from double, from from play it cool to double standards, um, even that one, which is standards, the live smoke sessions, it's just a little odd. You know what I mean? And most especially the David Bowie, the most recent one. Yeah. You know, I'm not doing the same 500 songs that everybody else is mm -hmm. doing because I feel that jazz is dying out, and it's a lot. It's jazz's fault. You have to stop. We can't uh, get the young kids interested in it. Yep. So wait, so all right, you you keep um <laughs> answering the questions I have for you before I'm able to ask them. My last I'm question. So sorry. No, I love it. It's amazing. Well, I'm gonna ask you now that I read in an interview, and I mean it's not breaking news that jazz is dying and the market is shrinking. Um, what is your prescription from from for resuscitating her? Well, I found one thing. I mean, I really have found this in the 20 years I've now almost yeah, 20 years now that I've been professionally recording and being a jazz musician. I mean, the time before that, I sang jazz as a stand-up comic. Right. So, I mean, so I've always been doing jazz live. I don't, people, people that know me as a stand-up comic didn't, who only saw me on television, didn't realize that there was so much music involved in my act. Mm. But, you know, there is. Um, what I've done is I've taken songs, like if you look at the second record, I put out Double Standards. The first mm -hmm. record did incredibly well. It, what, what the first record did was it brought in this um, Broadway group of people who knew me from Broadway, right? Mm -hmm. But it never really, never really liked jazz, never really come to jazz. Right. They started jazz. So I, there was new blood that was being infused. Um, with the Double Standards record, what I brought in was young people, young people, huh. like young, like okay. 20, 20 to 20, 20 to 30 year old people coming in to hear jazz and screaming about it. Now the David Bowie record, it's even more so. My audiences for the Bowie record are 18 and up. And you no, know, because mm -hmm. nobody under the age of 70 doesn't know who David Bowie right. is. So for me, it's, it's a couple of things. One is that, the music. You can only listen to the same 500 songs so many times. Even when a genius is, even if Cedar Walton is playing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, which is one of my favorite things on the planet, by the way. Bless mm. you, Cedar. Um, even, even when it's that, you can only listen to it so many times. So giving, stirring it up, giving them something different. I think that's important, mm -hmm. right? I yeah. think it's also, we have to get out of this jazz as some kind of ch church to be worshipped that a lot of the older guys do. Hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, I think like the snobbery lost. that's involved or? The snobbery, the jazz snobbery. <laughs> we need to get away from that because I look at these, like if you look at jazz on a sun, on a summer afternoon, if you look at yeah. that, that documentary, these people were entertaining. Yes, yes. They, no one could say Anita O'Day is not entertaining in that in that movie, right? I mean, you just look at her with the outfit she has on, yep. the whole thing. 
the sweet Georgia Brown, that whole thing. It's fucking amazing. Yeah. So now it's become this place where you got to be like so reverent. And so like, how about just making a joyful noise? Because mm-hmm. I think that's what jazz is about. So entertaining. I'm, I think that that's really important. And that's something that I do. I very entertaining when I'm on stage. I don't like, so, no, this next song was written in 1953. <laughs> but blah, 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 blah. who cares? Sing it. And, you know, I make them because I have stand up comic roots. When I patter in between songs, it's, it's funny. And then I also think that a lot of us, in terms of singers, now this is where I'm going to fault singers. Mm-hmm. Um, we have gotten that what jazz is about and what it was always about in the beginning was finding your own voice mm-hmm. and your own sound. And almost every singer out there is trying to just sound like whoever made the most money last. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's been very important to me. People, I have heard myself compared, I kid you not, to everybody from Peggy Lee to Bob Hope, literally Bob Hope. <laughs> I literally told them that I sound like Bob Hope. The reason I hear that is because there is no one to compare me to. I sound like me and very distinctly me. I mm-hmm. sing like me, very distinctly me. This is my voice. This is my sound. This is what I want to say as a singer. That's what I do. And a lot of singers do not. Hmm. The great ones do. And, you know, we've yeah. talked about a few of them over the course of time. Mm-hmm. Like you can tell Janice Siegel in five seconds when you hear her. Right. Yep. John Reeves in five seconds when you hear her. You know, mm-hmm. I know you go on the older ones, but I, that's what I think. I think that if you are giving, if you're entertaining and you're doing something different and you are a pro at what you do, the audience will follow. Yeah. It's amazing that you said that exact thing about people having their own sound because my husband is a bass player and he talks about that all the time that it used to well, be that. That was the first, that was the first requirement. Yeah. I mean, if you, I can, I, any of us with ears, like I can listen to a record and go, that's Ray Brown playing the bass. Right. Mm-hmm. Listen to a record and go, that's Chris McBride playing the bass. Right. I mean, yep. there are certain people that just, they just, you have a sound that's, and on a bass, you're like, how do they right. get a different sound? How do you get that tone? I mean, when I did my second record with Chris, I was like, I, Chris, how the fuck do you get that tone on that bass? <laughs> no, I'm so flabbergasted by the sound that comes out of your bass. And right. everybody has the same bass. You well, right. obviously they don't. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And absolutely. Yeah. And mm-hmm. just like when you hear a saxophone, I can tell John Coltrane in in, in three notes. That's yep. John Coltrane. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. He's endeavored very hard to have his own sound on that instrument. Yeah. And he does. It's a tonal quality that is indicative only of him and no one else. Hmm. And I oh, just yeah. think that's really important. And I thank my father for that, I want to say. Okay. My father told me when I was a kid, you want to be a singer, you be a musician. Don't be a singer. Be a mm-hmm. musician. That was his thing. You want to read music. You want to learn. You want to learn it. You want to understand it. And you want to have your own sound. Yeah. He was really very amazing. Very- hey, folks at home, are you enjoying this conversation? If so, help us raise money for the Ali Forney Center tonight, please, by sending in whatever you can via Venmo and PayPal. The links are below. And also, I, I know that if you're watching on Facebook, those links are going to be in the comment section as well. So please, no, no donation is too small. Um, and none too big. Um, I w- did want to ask you, you sing something that I, I love so much about your singing is that you use, you sound like you, but you use a lot of different vocal colors. Yes. You know, and and um, I was curious, I was like, are those things that happen in the moment? Are you reacting to the band? Do you plan some of those out ahead of time? How do you make those choices? Never plan. Okay. I never plan anything. Ah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, almost all of them are choices that I make in the moment or in reaction to the music that's around me. Do you know what I mean? Like when I, I hear a band, I hear something in my head, and that's what comes out. Are you also? Do you think like your experience as an actress informs some of those choices? 
Absolutely. And then now we go back to entertaining. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Yes. I think that my experience with an actress, I also think my experience is a stand-up comic. What do jazz and acting and stand-up comedy all have in common? Listening. Uh, <laughs> with that, it's the basis of all of it. If you're not listening and you're not present, you're not going to be very good at any of those things. Uh. So I think that especially stand up because I'm not afraid to be like in the middle of a song just to do something funny. Right. Like if I'm scatting or something, if I'm blowing, you know what I mean? Yep. I'm not afraid in the middle of a blow to do something that'll make the audience laugh. Huh. And it's just another emotion that'll come out. And if I'm feeling it, it's going to happen. You yep. know what I mean? Yeah. But the, yeah, the choices, but the choices that I make, I never go into a recording studio, especially with any choice made because I'm a very staunch believer in that jazz is a collaboration. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, when I record, I don't, we do it the old fashioned jazz way. Everybody's in the studio at the same time. Yep. Yep, Tracks yep. haven't been laid down that we're singing on top of. Not mm -hmm. Michael Buble. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm working with people who are all in a room and we're creating at the same time. Like, you know, we let's let's for example, Janice on uh, the last record, the Boy Records, yeah. Janice and I do Suffragette City together. Mm -hmm. That's the one and only take that we did of Suffragette City. Are you kidding me? No, there was no point. Okay, there are two tracks on that record that are that that was the one and only takes that we did that one and a Let's Dance. There was okay. no point. Hmm. They were. It was just perfect and vi vibrant. And you can just, you can just feel Janice and I loving each other while we sing this song and just having the time of our life blowing Bowie and just digging it, mm -hmm. you know? Something. So, yeah, I never have a preconceived notion. I want it all to be collaborative. Yeah, yeah. And that thing, listening and reacting in the moment to what what the group is, is doing is sort of, yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I wanted to ask about the Bowie album, um, Suffragette City and um, Boys Keep Swinging. Stood out to great. in that, I mean, I love it. The thing, like that music, some of these tunes really get turned on their head in a, in a beautiful way because a woman is singing that. Was that mm -hmm. something you like knew going in and that was part of your decision to make that record or? or... I, my gender, I never, I barely ever sing my gender. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's so passe anymore. You know, if they call me sir, I say thanks. If they call me, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't even care anymore. But um, um, Suffragette City, I did really think about it. That's one I really did think about in terms of gender and in terms of having Janice sing it, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the other stuff, it literally, it all it was was um, I've always been a huge David Bowie fan. I knew that I wanted to make this record. Um, I tried to talk the suits in the Warner Jazz world into making this record. Yeah. They wow. didn't, they couldn't see it. Wow. They didn't understand that this was a good record to make. Um, I put a concert together for the London Jazz Festival. It sold out immediately. Uh, you know, the, the House of David, Delirium Plus Boys equals jazz. That mm -hmm. was a concert. Sold out immediately. They had to add another concert. Wow. The suits came Suits came to the second show, saw people screaming, applauding, sometimes singing along, and they went, okay, now we get it. And then of course, Warner Jazz went under right after that. So then it took me another two years to get this damn record out. I had to do it myself. Right. But uh, yeah, mostly of what I saw and loved in it was first of all, my, my deep love for David Bowie. I'm just mm -hmm. a huge David Bowie fan and have been my entire life for more reasons than just his music, because, you know, I was a, the littlest bold growing up in a tiny little town <laughs> outside of St. Louis, Missouri, you know, watching Saturday night live and out comes David Bowie in a skirt, mm. you know, <laughs> singing Kurt Vile. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. with drag queens backing him up. Yeah. And I was like, I am, you know, he taught me that you could be as weird as you want and wow. still be fucking awesome. You know huh. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, I have a deep love. I have a deep love for him. I also think he's a brilliant songwriter. I think his songs are just amazing. Yeah. To 
and to put them into the language of jazz, you really get to hear the lyrics now. I mean, I've had a lot of people say that to me, and I really feel that too. Mm -hmm. You really hear the lyrics to Life on Mars. Yep. You really hear the, the, you know, the lyrics to Modern Love and stuff. You know, you really get the point of what he was trying to say. So that's, that's, my, that's my favorite record. I'm very proud of it. I love it. Um, actually, look at you. I had planned to roll a little bit of Modern Love. So uh, let's hear a little bit of that now. Go for it. Go for it. It's not really work. It's just the power. when we play clips for some reason tonight. Thank you for. I can't hear the clips either. So I don't okay. know what that is. I can hear the clips. We just played sort of this middle section of Modern Love. I just love that track. It's, um, it just feels, um, it's very powerful, very powerful. It feels deeply, your performance feels deeply personal. I don't know if you wanted to talk about that, just that for people, if people are watching and they don't have a lot of experience recording, um, and just talking about how to approach a performance in that way. I'm also interested for you to talk a little bit about, because you can't, you have plenty of experience in musical theater where it's like, yeah, kind of, you're supposed to sing what's on the page. I know, I, that's not my bag either. Yes. <laughs> but having to sing the same thing eight times a week is a pain in the fucking ass. That's what I, do. <laughs> I, I do it because I love the applause. But I fucking hate having to sing the same thing eight times a week. Um, how do you get the music off the page? You, I mean, we, I, we, I don't want to. We were gonna roll a clip of your um arrangement of all that jazz because it's yeah. such. It, it just is, and that's a tune we've all got. We all know what that sounds like, mom. But you know, when you like totally move, your phrasing is so Ooh, different. It's a boogaloo. It's um, a boogaloo, baby. How do you do that? If if somebody is, you know, if you had a student who was used to who coming from classical or musical theater where they weren't naturally sort of an improviser, naturally comfortable with that, could you tell somebody what it is? How to do well, that? Yeah, I mean, the the first thing is what when I'm reinventing or, or like listening to something, I always, there's always a, a hook or an idea or something that you hear and you run with that. Um, in this particular instance for this, this one, um, it was Goldings who said, let's do all that jazz. Ah. It was Larry who said, let's do all that jazz. And I said, well, we can't just swing it. I mean, it already is a swing tune. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. And then it what this time it was Matt Pearson who went. Okay. Oh, how about a boogaloo? We huh. have a boogaloo, and Goldings just went. Ring, <laughs> bum, 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 bang, bum, 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 bang. And then in they came and like boom, boom, done. Come okay. on, babe, why don't we paint the town? So and all that jazz. I'm gonna rouge my knees, I'll roll my sockings down. You know, it's like just, it's a 
heirloom. It's nice. So it was the rip, the rhythm he, the band was laying down for you. Like you were reacting to that essentially in the yeah. way that you phrase yeah. it. I okay. sang a boogaloo the way one should sing a boogaloo. Okay. So it becomes more about, you know, just like a modern love, I'm singing a gospel tune the way one should sing a gospel tune. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh huh. Uh huh. I try to, I try to immerse myself in the style of the song that's happening. Okay. You know, I mean, when I sing a when I sing a ballad, it's so small. It's just that's like that. People be so surprised. People are always so surprised when they hear me sing a ballad because I'm just so big, personality wise, right. everywhere else. When I do a ballad, I'm so small, you know, and I just go right into my heart and my soul, and mm. and I cut it open and give it to you to see, you know, which I think is something that a lot of performers do have a problem with. I think that's an, that's okay. that's one that's hard for us. Hmm. I know when I do master classes, that one's very hard for people. Okay. Just to, to be present in a ballad. Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, and the vulnerability. Yeah, to be able to express your vulner, vulnerability in song is something I think a lot of singers have an issue with. And it's painted on a lot. And you can always tell when they paint it on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. You know yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you can. But if you want to give, if you want to do a great show, like if you want to give a performance, and you know, I, I've seen you, Gabrielle. I know you do this. So if you want to give a great performance, there has to be colors. There has to be an ebb and flow. There has to be a beginning, a middle, and an end. There has to be a denouement. There has to be all of that that we have in art. So a ballad is a really important part of that. Unfortunately, a lot of singers go right out on stage, and the first thing they do is a ballad. You've got to earn a ballad. Yes! <laughs> You've got to earn it. You have to like get the audience in the palm of your hand uh -huh. and then you give them the ballad. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I yeah. generally like standard because I'm good at a set. Standard for me is I do a ballad after I kick the audience's ass with a big number, like a just blow my face off number where they just go insanely crazy, you know, Ella in Rome kind of number. Right. Just crazy. <laughs> So that they feel like they've got nothing else to give. And then I give them that little vulnerable, mm -hmm. simple yeah. Philadelphia or every breath I take, or, mm -hmm. you know, any, any of the number of ballads that you don't know what love is uh, the ballads that I've done. Yeah. Yep. I just, it's important. Yeah. You take them on a journey that way. Again, entertainment. Mm -hmm. I know. I know. Um, I think Julie, Julie was, Let's let's roll. Let's let people since we talked about it. Let's let people hear a little a little taste of of all that jazz. Oh, it's so good. Do it. So good. Why don't we paint the town All that jazz I'm gonna lose my knees And roll my stocking now All that jazz Start the car I know what best spot The gin is cold and the piano's hot It's just a noisy Oh well there's a night that brawl And all So hot. I yes. love it. Can you hear me? And I was like, are we gonna have sound? Are we gonna have sound? <laughs> um, yeah, I love it. I love it. And I since we talked about it, I wanted people to know what we were talking about. Um, but it's funny because last week Billy Stritch actually brought this same thing up, and we were saying how it is unfortunate that at some point the jazz police came along and said that like if it's jazz. It can't, it can't also be entered, it can't be, there can't be any like showbiz in there. And, and I don't agree with that, but. Whenever anybody says that to me, do you know what I think of? <laughs> I think of the Bill Evans, Tony Bennett duet collaboration. Oh. Huh. Where if you ever watch it, I mean, who's better than Bill Evans? So Bill Evans, junkie, 
in a secondhand tuxedo. It's just, you can, it's just thread wear. Mm -hmm. He's like pulling the tux over his sleeves that are just, you can just see it's just, and you're just nodding out playing the piano. Mm -hmm. Being Bill Evans, just playing the piano. And then, and then Tony Bennett is like, <laughs> Tony Bennett! Showbiz! Yeah. But the combination is so fantastic. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when you, I look at that and I think the original guys, like the guys, the cats, like I was saying before about Anita, those people who gave us this, mm -hmm. right? This didn't exist before them. These are the people that gave us this. These are the, the, the ones that you worship. Right. And they didn't have a problem with show business and Tony Bennett. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right. Why the fuck y'all do? <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem? Uh-huh. Yeah. You know? Yep. But that's why, but there's certain people you go see and you just, that are, really get it and are incredibly entertaining. And mm -hmm. then there are other people that you just go, you well, know, I'm glad I came and I heard this music, but what a snore fest. Do, right. do something, you know, be, yeah. be an incredibly brilliant musician, but please give me something in the middle of the songs. Please, anything, whatever that is. Yeah. I think um, Kurt Elling is extremely entertaining. That man I love me some on Kurt. a damn show. And like, there's no question that, that, that man has, can put on a show. Yeah. You know? So th these are not. These things are not mutually exclusive. Um, no, they are not. And I think there's a lot of us out there that prove that point. Yeah. Yep. You know. um, I'm going to play one last clip, ask you a little bit. I'm going to play um, part of your performance um, at the Newport Jazz Festival. You headlined oh. Newport oh, Jazz. I was wearing my little check shorts. Yes, you were. <laughs> In 2002, and um, George Wolf I saw this. George Wolf saw, saw this and called me and said, "You may never wear shorts on stage again." <laughs> you got in trouble. <laughs> Did you listen? I'm very upset with my shorts. Oh, that's hilarious! It's hot. You're outside. It's hot. It's freaking hot, and you're in the sun. Yeah, it's hot as hell. And they're cute little check shorts. I like they're my show shorts. shorts, George. Doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> um, so I want to play a little bit. We're going to, you have this fantastic, uh, long, you know, really open up arrangement of of the Cy Coleman tune, I've Got Your Number, that we talked about. But I want to. Uh, you going to show me scatting? Uh-huh. That went nuts that day. I was having a good time. I want to talk to you about that. So, <laughs> let's, and you know the, de the deal. If I come back in and there's no sound, Julie will fix it. Just give us a second. Oh. But this is you at Newport singing, I've Got Your Number. Oh, I've got your number and what you're looking for. And what you're looking for suits me fine. We'll break the rules a lot. We'll be damned. But then how could we not? Why should we not combine when I've got your number and I've got the glow you got? Bye. 
I couldn't hear it, so. Okay. Well, it was amazing. Um, before before we talk about this, I want to thank um, Billy Stritch. Thank you, Rick Hinkson. Thank you, Todd Foreman, for sending in donations. We thank you so much. You uh, can send us donations to help us raise money for the Alley Forney Center. Shout out to Billy. Hey, Billy boy. <laughs> you can send... Yeah, he gave us money and we thank him. We thank you. Um, you can send uh, money via Venmo at Gabrielle-Stravelli or paypal.me slash Gabrielle Stravelli. Sorry, either way, you can't avoid my long Italian name, but it's worth it because- I understand, darling. I know you do. I know you, and you're Sicilian too, right? The very Sicilian, my love. Um, yes, Paisan. We uh huh. That's on. right. <laughs> um, so yeah, we thank everybody watching uh, who has donated already, and we thank you in advance if you are going to. Um, so that solo. Uh oh, oh thank sound. you. So the solo you sang. Um, it was funny. I was thinking, sound. like, what exactly do I? I don't Lost really want to ask. Oh, no sound. Please save us. There's no sound. She's going to help us. Thank you, Julie. Hi, my friends. So, Leah, can you hear her now? Can you hear me? I'm going to talk for you. Okay, great. Thank you, Julie. Sure. Um, I, the, the, in regards to the solo at Newport and just your solo in general, like, I was trying to think, well, what do I want to ask her? Do I want to ask her if she's listening to the changes and blah? I don't. The thing that struck me about that solo. Of course, I'm listening to it. Of course I am. Yeah. Of course I am. I know. Yeah. But the the thing that stands out about it to me, it's so free. It's so playful. You have maintained that child, that sense of like kids in a sandbox. Um, and furthermore, it feels to me like you have given yourself permission to just go for it and to like not censor. I, I was working with, I was in a class the other week working with some singers and somebody was um singing and I was like, you know what? It's technically correct, but it's too polite. Yeah. And I think, it's, I think, I think for a lot of women don't give themselves permission to like, let it be sloppy. Let it be, you know what? I, I want you to now, talk about that. Now that's also, I blame the industry for that mm. because they enforce women to be a certain way yeah. and more so than they do male singers. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, more set different than anything else. Right. right. But um, the industry, they don't, they don't want you to be a musician. They want you to be a pretty girl with a pleasant voice. So if you, you know, step anywhere outside of that, then you're doing something remarkable. Hmm. truly because you know mostly no one's doing that right so yeah i mean again also they want they, that pleasant voice thing i think that's the the worst it's like the worst thing the onus that they put on female singers mm -hmm. i want you to use everything you have in your arsenal yeah every fucking thing that is from your, a bell to your falsetto to a weird sound to whatever it is. Uh -huh. I mean, you think Bobby McFerrin ever thinks twice about the noises that come out of his mouth? Right. You no. know, no. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, you're talking about students, but I always tell my students that uh, 
the, you know, don't be afraid to fail. And if you're going to fail, fail big, mm -hmm. like really just go for it. I mean, the wonderful thing about music is it's there and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. So if you do make a, whatever, mis what, what you might consider a mistake, it's gone. Mm -hmm. You you know what I mean? You're living yep. in the moment. You're just bringing it up. Don't, you know, don't kick yourself in the head. Just go, oh, I learned from that. Now I go on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to learn from anything if you play it safe. Right. You got to make mistakes. Yeah. You got to make mistakes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you got to go for it. I mean, like I'm on that stage there and that's Seamus Blake that I'm blowing with. Right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's Gil Goldstein on the piano. That's my girls, Marianne McSweeney and Barbara Merjan on the drums. I mean, you know, where you think Gil Goldstein's playing it safe? He's not playing it safe. Right. Yeah. Also, yep. what the fuck kind of chords was he playing? Did you hear that shit? <laughs> that's like, how do you make a block chord sound even bigger? You only got 10 fingers like everybody else, man. And it's, yeah, just amazing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're, you're up there with, I'm up there with giants, people that I consider giants. So I'm not going to hold back or be nervous about it. I'm going to do what I can do and just challenge them to meet me as well. I mean, we're just, that's what all we're doing. There's a little bit of show offness that happens in jazz. I mean, we're mm -hmm. all like, oh yeah, you think you've been, you think you've been better than me? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've gone a little long. Can do you mind? Can we feel one question from sure. our audience? Sure. Someone oh, asked. Hear it. <laughs> Is there a standard tune from musical theater or jazz that you find already translates well, or one that you'd like to transform? Oh, I see what what they're saying. Um. I don't. I'm glad that you do. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I see what they're saying. Um, I'll tell you what I, my, my first initial response to that is almost any Richard Rogers uh, song, ah. any Richard Rogers tune uh, translates incredibly well to jazz. And, and oh. in fact, I'm currently doing a live version of yesterday's. Again, it's a standard, but I'm doing it in um, a very, how shall I put this? It's very contemporary the way I'm doing it. It's a okay. very contemporary feel to this piece of jazz. I've got a little hook that's in it. It's got, you know, a whole different style and it goes into a huge blowing section. Um, that's, that's all about the blow. Uh, so any Richard Rogers works immensely great for jazz in terms mm. of musical theater. Okay. Like any Michael John Lacusa also. Um, yeah, I, I, in terms of musical theater, um, the more recent pieces, I've been kind of obsessed with doing something interesting with Hamilton. And um, because I think that there's, in kind of the same way that Oscar Peterson did West Side Story, I think I might be able to do something with Hamilton. I'm concerned um, for the racial conversation that will happen oh. from it. You know, but yeah. we're talking about, a, but I feel like we're talking about a musical language, you know, this is, yeah. it, and, and yeah. the, yes, of course, Hamilton, that's a, that's the entire conversation of the play as far as I'm concerned. Right. Race. But music is a different animal, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I think that there's something really interesting music wise that I can do with like seven to 10 songs from Hamilton in the same way that, like you said, when you showed the Oscar Peterson. Yeah. Movie. So I, right now I'm mulling over Hamilton and I think something, I think that might be my next interesting thing. Nice. Well, I think we can wrap up. We're gonna leave, leave everybody with, you've piqued our interest now. We can wait for, for you to release that. Um, Julie will take you out into the uh, back into the green room, and I'm just gonna say goodbye to folks and let them know who's on next week. But this has been a who is on next week? This guy, this amazing guy. He's a Japanese flugelhorn. He's like a star in in Japan. There, you know, Japan has this huge audience for jazz. Yes, I know. It's Japanese it's are bigger. insane for jazz. Yeah, yeah, and it's sad because it's like this. American music is not popular here, but it's super popular in other parts of the world. Um, 
So uh, he's a beautiful, he's a flugelhorn player and a vocalist. And he actually sounds a lot like he's definitely heavily influenced by Kurt Elling, but he's a, uh -huh. a just a beautiful player, a beautiful, beautiful vocalist and, um, and a beautiful guy. So we, we are uh, gonna have a conversation with Toku uh, next week. Yes, that's him. I met mm -hmm. him when I went there when I was in Tokyo two years ago and he's, he's really incredible. He's super special. So, so, um, well actually just stay with me now. I'll just do my little wrap. I thank you for joining us tonight. This was, Oh, thank you for having me. Such a pleasure. I invite everyone to come to my nightclub in Provincetown. If you happen to be in Provincetown, Massachusetts what? this summer, please go to the club. What? And uh, well, enjoy what? it. What is the club? That's my nightclub. That's it's called the club. It's called The Club. Got it's it. in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Okay. We can't have a performance at the moment like nowhere else, but we do have a lovely kitchen and uh, a beautiful, beautiful deck with a fantastic view of the bay. And it's uh, one of the nicest places in town. And please go and enjoy the food and the, the pretty water. And if I'm around, there's a piano there. I may start singing anyway, even though they don't want me to. <laughs> awesome. Hey, if I'm six feet away from you, I can do it. That's right. Um, fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I will reiterate that we are gratefully accepting donations tonight via Venmo and PayPal at Gabrielle-Stravelli or PayPal just Gabrielle Stravelli so that we can give some money to the Ali Forney Center. They're doing really, really amazing work um, helping LGBTQ plus homeless youth. So please give whatever you are able to. Um, let's see, what else am I supposed to say? Oh, join me online tomorrow night, if you can, 7 p.m., do my Willie Nelson set. Um, also, that's why I felt like a kinship with you for the Bowie album, because it's it's weird choices, but why not? Why the hell not? Hell, yeah. hell yes. Um, thank you, Julie Garnier, who you guys got to see tonight. <laughs> My producer who makes all this stuff happen. Thank you to Jim Caruso and the staff at Birdland for supporting us in this effort. And thank you, Leah, one more time for joining us. Thank all you, right, girl. Paul, we're going to sign off. Thank you so... Oh, Leah's website. Julie's Julie's yelling at me. That's all right. People can find you on Twitter and Instagram at Real... Real Leo Delaria. Real Leo Delaria.com, Facebook, Real Leo Delaria.com, website. I believe it's, uh, it's, I think it's Leo Delaria.com. Yep. <laughs> we got the banners ready to go. Beautiful. So, yeah. yeah see all the things I'm doing. Great. And y'all. This is nothing. There is <laughs> nothing going on. There will be at some point. So, Putting follow on her. And man, check out those albums. You have beautiful, these beautiful albums that should be in everybody's record collection. So get into it, y'all. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us tonight. Bye, everybody.